Welcome to the Rob Seco Field Ready Podcast with your host, Jim Robinson. Hello, and welcome back to the Rob Seco Field Ready Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Robinson. Starting a couple of years ago, Rob Seco embarked on a project to measure the relative efficacy of different types of corn rootworm control measures. To give an update on those efforts, we have our project leader for the project with us here today. It's Wayne Fithian. Wayne, welcome back. Good to be here, Jim. Nice to <laughs> nice to have the opportunity to talk about our rootworm work. Exactly. So, first of all, before we get into description of the work and everything, can you tell us just a little bit about what was the motivation for getting this project off the ground? We wanted to be able to provide our, our customer base with a, re- a really good understanding of, I, I think one of the important things, corn rootworm is very hard insect to control. Because it it spans two growing seasons, in some cases three, so we wanted to to give farmers a little bit more insights into how to think about corn rootworm and and to connect the beetle flight from one summer with the rootworm pressure to the next summer. Mm -hmm. And and one of the big reasons we wanted to do that was a little bit self-centered, and that was to be able to talk about AgriSure Duracade Mm -hmm. and to be able to compare the efficacy of uh, hybrids with the AgriSure Duracade trait for control of corn rootworm uh, to other control strategies that are available in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because if if you place the traps correctly uh, and and not too close to each other, they, they become a reflection of what the larval pressure was was because the larvae turned into the beetles that emerged. So you can, by measuring how many beetles emerged in a part of a field with one control strategy versus a part of the field with another strategy, well, then you can get an idea of how well the strategy worked in limiting the population of the insect. And then finally, I mean, you could go do that with a with an efficacy, stu- efficacy study. You know, you mm-hmm. could compare six or eight different control methods at a location. Mm-hmm. And you could learn a lot, but really we decided that it would be more interesting to look at lots and lots of locations over a great big geography as a way to measure uh, the efficacies of these control strategies because that way it it does a better job of mirroring what farmers will see across big geographies. You know, a single Mm -hmm. trial does a really good job of comparing a set of treatments at that location. But when you look at a whole bunch of different planting dates, a whole bunch of different rainfall patterns, a whole bunch of different insect hatch timings relative to the growth stage of the corn – then you start to get a little, I think, bigger picture of Absolutely. how those control strategies are performing. Absolutely. So you started to touch on this just a little bit. You're wanting to use a really wide geography with a lot of locations. But can you tell us a little bit about how the study was conducted? How do you measure corn rootworm beetles in the field? Yeah, so we, uh, we, uh, we used a, a no-bait sticky trap, mm-hmm. uh, which is a, a pretty simple, it's a it's kind of like a piece of uh, stiff card paper mm-hmm. that's about eight inches by four inches, and it has a grid on it, which helps it makes it easier to count the number of beetles. Yep, <laughs> especially if you got a lot of them on the trap. And uh, we bought this trap at uh, at, a, at a, a farm supply store, mm-hmm. so they're readily available. Uh, we we used a no bait trap, so it doesn't have a pheromone that attracts the insects to it. It only captures the ones that fly into it, right, and stick. Because once they fly into it, they can't get off of it. Yes. Of course, that means that they have a limited life. So we replace them every week for three weeks. So we'd put a trap out, come back a week later, replace it with a fresh trap, count the beetles on the trap, do it again till we had three weeks of data captured on each one of those fields where we had a trap out. And, and the other reason we use the sticky trap is that the work that's been done by universities to correlate how many beetles results in how much corn rootworm damage the following season or Mm -hmm. two years later if it's an extended diapause problem with the northern corn rootworm species. All that work's been done with a a sticky trap. Mm -hmm. So if you used a pheromone trap, you might attract more beetles than the sticky trap because they might fly in from a pretty good distance because they sense that pheromone versus just accidentally flying into it, right? Exactly. So we wanted to mimic uh, the university work in terms of interpretation of, well, how if I have, you know, 0.8 beetles per trap per day, what does that mean? Yep. Yep. At what point are those thresholds in which I need to take different controls, control measures for the following year? Yeah. One of of the, one of the, one of the difficulties when you go over a wide geography, we were, we were in eight states mm-hmm. over the last three years with these traps, is that you got to figure out when the rootworm are going to hatch mm-hmm. at each location from 
northern Kansas and and uh, southern Iowa and Nebraska all the way up into uh, you know North Dakota and central Minnesota. So we we did also uh, vary our trap placement dates as we went from south to north so that we could catch that peak. Our intent wasn't to catch the first beetle. Yep. It really wasn't to catch the last beetle that emerged. We just wanted to see what's that population doing when you have the majority of the population out there. So we were looking for a peak in the middle week, a good number of beetles on each side so that we, and not being out too early or too late. So we used what we know about corn rootworm and, and when they hatch by latitude. Mm-hmm. And then we, we also uh, tweaked that a little bit based on weather the past growing season because the rootworm eggs are on a GDU cycle, just like their host crop corn. Yep, right? they co-evolved. So <laughs> they co-evolved. So uh, the time between egg laying and egg hatch is influenced by fall, winter, and spring temperatures. Absolutely. So in a really warm fall and spring, we'd move that hatch date, anticipated hatch date up. Mm-hmm. Conversely, if we had a really cold, slow spring, we'd move it back a little bit in each of our geographies from south to north exactly and so you know the group did a really nice job of, of really capturing that peak i mean it on the rob Seco webpage if you go to the agronomy projects uh, tab you can you can actually find this study there and in there you'll see a graph that, that shows the number of beetles caught per week of the traps being out you can see that peak nicely uh, between week one week, week two and week three where there's nice peak in week two yeah Mm-hmm. We we were we were lucky enough with our educated guests to hit that peak. That Absolutely. was a good thing. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the uh, what are the outputs from these traps? I mean, obviously, as as our guys would go out and take the traps each week, they'd count the number of beetles on the traps. Often taking a picture to count it at home, so they're out of the heat. Uh, what did they find? What were they measuring on those traps? Well, we reported all the data as the average number of beetles per day. By species. So mm-hmm. we'd, we'd count how many northerns were on there, on that trap as it set out for a week. And then if there were 21, then we'd divide that by seven. So mm-hmm. that would be three, right? Yeah. That'd be a lot of a lot of beetles per day, right? So I just <laughs> used that number to be as a good example. But uh, the reason we wanted to follow northern and western, of course, is because, especially as you move north, mm-hmm. the northern corn rootworm becomes more of a, a more prevalent And uh, because it can have that extended diapause and hatch two years later, we wanted to make sure we understood what the risk was in corn following soybeans, Mm because that's an indication of what the extended diapause population is doing. Now, further west and certainly further south and in the continuous corn situations where western corn rootworm tends to dominate, then we we just, you know. And and our data definitely showed where, where you have a lot of westerns, you don't have very many northerns. Exactly. And that's mainly the corn-on-corn locations. And where you have corn-following soybeans, northerns outnumber westerns and uh, outnumber them by a little more than three to one. So yeah. northern pressure is quite a bit heavier in those uh, in those soybean fields. Now, that we also have to consider the western variant of the western or the east, the soybean variant of the western corn rootworm. Sorry, that's a little bit of a, <laughs> of a mouthful to get out. It is. Uh, that's been documented in parts of Illinois. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have not yet observed that insect pest in our trapping program. So we've gotten over as far as, you know, the center of Illinois along kind of the I-94 corridor and up into the kind of the northwest corner. But we just haven't been in fields where corn was following soybeans where we caught a significant number of westerns so we, we mm-hmm. were still even in those fields seeing more northerns so our data set really doesn't reflect what's going on with the western variant mm-hmm. and of course if you have the western variant it's kind of like being in nebraska and raising corn on corn you got to think about controlling corn rootworm absolute period right yes because a lot of those beetles that we caught especially the westerns that we caught in Corn on soybeans were, were often beetles that flew in from an adjacent or nearby cornfield. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, beetles, corn rootworm beetles love pollen. Mm-hmm. And if there isn't a lot of pollen readily available in a cornfield and they're near soybeans, they smell that po- pollen. If there's pollen in that soybean field, they'll go to those soybeans. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, and uh, then they'll come back into the corn thinking, oh, gosh, I, this is where I'm supposed to be laying my eggs. And sometimes they'll run into the trap, right? Exactly. And that's, I think, where a lot of those Westerns came from in our uh, corn-following soybeans. Absolutely. So 
tell me a little bit about you know what what did you find in terms of of how many more corn rootworm beetles did you find in the corn on corn fields versus the corn on soybean fields sounds like there were more northerns in those corn on so- soybean fields than there were westerns but uh, what were the overall differences in beetles caught? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, we had about three times more northerns than westerns in corn-following soybeans, and we had about <laughs> maybe 20 times more westerns where corn followed corn. So mm-hmm. definitely westerns dominated corn-following corn. And overall, we had about three times more beetles in corn-on-corn just as you do a total count over species as compared to what we saw in corn following soybeans. And we'd, know, mm-hmm. we'd expect that, right? Because corn rootworm is traditionally a corn following corn problem. Exactly. I mean, they, they can only reproduce and, and actually mature as larvae by feeding on corn roots. They right. can't do it in any other crop. Yeah, so you'd expect it's, that. It's a beauty of rotation. Those rootworm eggs that got laid there, they hatch and they don't live. They, they you know, starve I'm, quick, I'm, pretty quickly. When it comes to corn pests, I'm a little statistic that way. I like that. You know, I also <laughs> like herbicides that kill the weed after it's submerged so that you can watch it die. But anyway, that's just because I like nice, clean corn fields that don't have insect pests. <laughs> but, exactly. Uh, but I had two, two other things I wanted to mention, and that is that, you know, we, we definitely saw an improvement in control measured by the number of beetles that emerged. Mm-hmm in fields where we had Duracade compared to some of their kind of tr- control strategies. So the control strategy sh- could have been another dual mode of action trait combination from a different company. Mm-hmm. Could have been a single mode of action with or without an insecticide. Right. Uh, so so we were really happy with how Duracade did in the trial. And in fact, we averaged a 15% fewer beetles compared to all other trialing, uh, all other control measures combined. Absolutely. And you have 15% when, when you're looking at the impact corn rootworm can have in the following year can mean the difference between you know, either a control measure failure or, or success when you're, you're actually thinking about you know, where that threshold lies. It, it can yep. be pretty significant. Yeah, And then the other thing I wanted to mention, just what we've seen over the last three years with this trapping study, is that the, uh, the you know, populations of, of insects, and they, 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 they kind of they vary by year. They they over time, they'll build, and then something will cause them to crash. And, mm-hmm. and, and we're definitely, based on our data right now, we're in a build phase. So corn rootworm is, is becoming a, a little bit, populations are becoming higher mm-hmm. in any kind of a rotation. And, and you know, corn, on, corn following soybeans or corn following corn, we're just seeing more rootworm than we were three, five years ago Absolutely. on a per, per plant per day or per trap per day kind of measurement. And then, and then the other thing is that the implication of that is, gosh, if I'm if I'm raising you know first year corn following soybeans and I don't I, you know I don't know what my uh, uh, you know what my beetle count was two years ago in an extended diapause area, you know you, you you need to be thinking about monitoring corn rootworm right now because the population is definitely in an upswing. Absolutely, and, and I think the big implication where is second year corn on corn. Mm-hmm. where not everybody so well, probably I can still get by this year. If you don't have beetle counts last year, our data would say you need to be thinking about some kind of a control measure in order to prevent damage. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at the amount of pressure that occurred in 2020, it was the highest pressure year for corn rootworm that we've had in the last eight or 10 years prior well, to it. Certainly in Rob Seco's existence since Absolutely. 2014. Yeah. yeah. And, and so that population of adults then... They all lay eggs, and with a single female able to lay up to 200 eggs uh, per female, that, that can add up to a lot of pressure next year, too. Yeah. And right now, we're, we're actually running through a winter where there's still a lot of time left for a lot of things to happen, but so far, it's in, we're in such a winter that it's favorable to the survival of those corner worm eggs. Yeah, I think that's right. We're, we're, we aren't too cold. Mm-hmm. We've had good snow cover when we have been cold. And uh, that snow cover is like putting a blanket on when you go to bed. It insulates those eggs that are out there waiting for next year. So, yeah. So what we've told a lot of our our uh, cooperators who allowed us to put these traps into their field is is typically that if you see a certain number of beetles caught per day, you should consider various levels of control measures. Obviously, the most effective control measure is probably rotation, uh, but. Could you walk us through a little bit on what those levels were? You know, we saw anywhere from, you know, a 
tenth of a beetle caught per day up to several tens of beetles caught per day. Yeah, we had some uh, some very high pressure fields that uh, that were certainly going to be high pressure fields again next year. So, mm-hmm. uh, if you look overall, uh, our average we were we were below that threshold level mm-hmm. uh, with our with our control strategies, uh, whether it was Duracade or or a slightly higher population in the other control methods. But uh, we were getting close. Mm-hmm. Corn on corn fields, still quite a ways away in the in the. Uh, with the northerns, but the westerns were getting close in those corn on corn fields, and and so you know I think uh, that that's a situation where I know I have to control the insect. Mm-hmm. There are various strategies for controlling the insect. There there are you know planting time insecticides. There are uh, trait. Uh, we I, I like the trait alternative. I think it's mm-hmm. a little more reliable in terms of having the control product or the the, the active ingredient there when the rootworm are going to hatch, especially if you like to plant corn really early. Absolutely. Now, if you're planting corn really late, then, then, I, then I almost use the other argument of soil and supplied insecticide might be better than a, than a trait because uh, the traits are designed for the usual situation, which would be early planted corn and early June hatching rootworms, at least in this latitude, mid, uh, mid-June as we go further north, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, it's a long time between April 25th and, uh, and, and June 10th, right? Exactly. <laughs> if you live uh, up there along the Minnesota-Iowa state line. Yeah, a lot of those roots can become pretty fibrous and, and result in a lower trait load if, if they're planted too early versus the hatch, or if you're well, planted too close, the expression may not be high and, enough. And, uh, and if you're planting on April 25th and you're putting down a soil applied insecticide and, and those roots aren't going to hatch till June 10th, mm-hmm. That's a long time, and, and the half-life of most of these soil-applied insecticides, there isn't going to be very much left. Now, if you're planting on May 6th and, and, uh, and the rootworm are going to hatch on June 5th, well, you're, you're fine. Right? Exactly. You're, you're in good shape there. And then there's also uh, the strategy of controlling the adults, right, a beetle mm-hmm. spray program. So you can, you can. A lot of farmers do a really nice job with beetle spray. They watch for that peak we talked about in terms mm-hmm. of the trap count. And... Uh, Make sure they have a few females that are carrying eggs. And boy, I tell you, if you haven't seen a, it's really easy to see which beetles are females and carrying eggs because they become really heavy. And, you know, they don't carry the baby in the middle. They carry her at the back end. So she gets really heavy at the back end. She has a hard time flying. She has a very hard <laughs> when time flying. you fly. see, you know, 10, 20% of those beetles carrying eggs like that, it's time to be on a beetle spray program. Absolutely. Catch them before they lay those eggs. Absolutely. So, Wayne, just to kind of summarize overall what we've talked about and, and how this project worked overall, over the last two seasons, uh, you've led a project wherein beetle traps, being small uh, yellow traps, sticky traps, where beetles would fly into the traps over the course of a three-week period in which those traps are counted every week to figure out how many beetles and of what species were caught on those traps each of those weeks. Uh, this has helped us kind of figure out what geographies, rotation patterns do we see the most beetles and of what species do we see those beetles? Westerns being most predominant as you are in the southern territories, you almost see no northerns. Northerns increasing in numbers as you move north. And now from a rotational uh, standpoint, we saw almost all of the northerns uh, uh, mostly falling into the uh, corn on soybeans uh, relative to, to westerns. And so, you know, corn on corn is going to be really, really heavy on westerns. Corn on beans, you're going to see a few more northerns than you see uh, elsewhere as a relative perspective. And then also, to compare control measures, we saw a 15% reduction in the emerged beetle populations when using a control measure such as Agrisure or Duracade as compared to single modes of action, uh, plus or minus uh, insecticide, and other dual mode of action trait products. Now, customers can uh, you monitor their beetle pressure and make decisions either in season or for the following season on how to best control those corn worm populations that are on the rise uh, and can best put themselves in a position for profitability. Anything else you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I just, uh, you, you, you uh, summarized really well, just that, you know, if you were, if you're going to do a quick, Quick look, our data said if you're in corn on corn, you better be controlling corn rootworm. And if you're in first year corn following soybeans, you better be getting some traps out or at least doing some beetle counts in that corn field so you know it's going to be okay two years from now. Exactly. Uh, our data says that uh, it's not like you can just assume there's no rootworm beetles out there. Yes. And then I referred a couple of times to a three-year study. Uh, we did do a, a, a 
I kind of threw it in in some of my comments because but we did have just a pilot study out, and we didn't have any control strategy comparisons in, in 2018. So mm-hmm. had some traps out, got some beetle counts, but uh, didn't have any control strategies, which is why the the summary you mentioned earlier that you can get on robseco.com is, uh, is just of uh, 19 and 20. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, so like Wayne said, if you want to read more about this project, go to www.robseco.com. And then under agronomy, select agronomy projects, and you'll find the uh, corn rootworm beetle monitoring project summary, along with several other projects that we've been working on here as a company. So thank you, Wayne, for joining us. I really appreciate your work on this. Yeah, it was fun, Jim. Thank you. As always, be sure to tune in on the 1st and 15th of every month for new episodes. And until then, stay field ready. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Rob Seco Field Ready Podcast. Join us next time to be field ready. A Huda Media Production.